Well, thank you for this, and uh, of course, thanks uh, for the uh, invitation. I'm extremely flattered to have been invited uh, uh, to talk of the uh, Dardanelles uh, in uh, this conference. So many thanks to the team. Uh, again, I will not uh, name names, uh, just in case I forget anybody. Well, uh, the French Army Museum at the Hôtel des Invalides in Paris has a small section devoted to the Dardanelles. A wall text in French is translated into English below, quote, although essentially a British operation, it was, it being the expedition, it was supported by the French. Thus, uh, the idea that uh, France only played a second fiddle is perpetuated to this day uh, by the official historians uh, of the French army. And in 1931, uh, the well-known journalist and commentator, well-known at the time, of course, uh, the well-known journalist and commentator Edmond Delage wrote in his classic uh, French account of the campaign, La Tragédie des Dardanelles, The Tragedy of the Dardanelles, quote again, there France only played, admittedly with glory, the role of a docile accomplice. Well, probably the first comprehensive account uh, on the French side for the general public came with the famous La Rousse uh, series, La Rousse, the uh, publishers of dictionaries, uh, La France Héroïque et ses Alliés, Heroic France and its Allies, published in installments uh, immediately after the war. And number 28 of these installments was simply entitled Au Dardanelles, at the Dardanelles. And in this, the mastermind behind the operation is squarely identified as Monsieur W. Churchill, who is described as overriding the objections of those who considered the straits impassable by a fleet which did not control the shores. My translation, he believed that the fall of fortresses such as Liège, Namur, Maubeuge, Antwerp, proved the inferiority of fixed defences when attacked by a superior artillery. And the editors continue uh, when uh, discussing the uh, composition of the fleet uh, eventually said, sent, quote, the total of 280 naval guns was more than sufficient according to Monsieur Churchill's theory, to obtain a result. A volume of the uh, semi-official history of the Great War, published by, again, a famous editor, uh, famous publisher, Payot, uh, in 1932, devoted to the uh, Armée d'Orient, the Army of the East, that is the whole of the Eastern Front, and written by an army captain, also blames Churchill and his forceful pleading uh, before the war cabinet uh, in January 1915. My translation again. Winston Churchill was eloquent, and he had a blind face in his grandiose project. He saw the enormous impact of the enterprise, but did not perceive its immense difficulties. Well, there is absolutely no account in the uh, La Rousse account uh, of uh, any Anglo-French negotiations on the uh, desirability or otherwise of launching an expedition. We simply learn out of the blue that the French Navy uh, agreed in February 1915 to contribute a substantial fleet. Yet, uh, the reasons for uh, the decision of, of the French government to back the proposal uh, of the British War Cabinet are not far to see. On the one hand, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, Churchill, repeated that no land forces would ever be needed, which meant no removal of British or French troops from the Western Front course, the priority uh, from the point of view of the French. 
And on the other hand, uh, the French Navy, as opposed to uh, the uh, French Army, was underemployed in the war effort at the time. So there was absolutely no reason to displace uh, the British Allies, whose land army was crucial in France. So no reason to displace uh, the Allies by refusing to lend support uh, in a purely naval operation which did not reduce, or so it was said, uh, the defences of the uh, Western Front in any way. It also seems that uh, Churchill's opposite number, the Minister of Marine, uh, Jean-Victor Augagneur, was, anyone, was easily won over uh, to the idea, uh, which found no resistance in the rest of the French government. Notably uh, from uh, the Minister of War, Alexandre Milran, uh, again, because uh, the land army would contribute nothing. Augagneur, the Minister of Marine, declared that the British idea was, my translation, sensible and reasonable. Also, uh, Admiral Gebrat, who was to command the French fleet under uh, the British Admiral, Admiral Carden, uh, Admiral Gebrat uh, argued, I agree uh, with Admiral Carden on every point and have absolute faith in complete success, whose consequences will be incalculable. So, a French fleet uh, was sent uh, from uh, southern France and uh, French North Africa uh, under Admiral Gepard uh, to form an Anglo-French force uh, commanded by Admiral Carden. The proportion was three British divisions to one French. In other words, uh, the French provided one-fourth uh, of uh, the whole force. And that force started to bombard the Turkish uh, forts on uh, the 19th of February, uh, 1915. As is well known, on the 5th of March, it was realised that it would never be possible to destroy or neutralise all the forts uh, guarding the straits by naval bombardment alone. Raids on land would have to be launched to uh, reduce them one by one. Well, uh, on the 12th of March, General Sir Ian Hamilton was appointed Commander-in-Chief of these land forces and sent to the area. But it was decided to proceed with a naval attack without waiting for the arrival of the troops. And on the 17th of March, uh, the French Admiral, Gepard, and uh, the French commander of the land forces, uh, General Damad, met the British commanders in charge of the operation uh, on board HMS Queen Elizabeth, moored at Tenidos. Sir Ian Hamilton and Admiral de Robeck, who had succeeded uh, Carden, was taken ill, uh, welcomed uh, French cooperation. In fact, uh, Admiral Gebrat required the honor of providing the front line of ships, which was granted. On the 18th of March, uh, the warships Bouvet, uh, Charlemagne, Gaulois, and Suffren entered the Straits. But the Gaulois was hit by a shell, and the Bouvet uh, ran against the mine sinking in less than two minutes uh, with some 600 men. Only uh, 65 survived. The British ships which followed were also seriously hit, but their men were rescued. So uh, the most uh, grievous, uh, grie um, grievous losses had been suffered by the French uh, with the instant tragedy of the Bouvet. In the late afternoon, Admiral de Robeck called off the operation. The La Rousse uh, publication makes much of the telegram uh, that is sent to the Admiral. I wish to draw the, the attention of the laws of the Admiral 
on the magnificent behavior of the French squadron. The heavy losses which it suffered did not reduce the bonus of its crews. It was led into battle by Admiral Gebhardt with the utmost gallantry. Well, Sir Ian Hamilton immediately understood that uh, his land forces would now be called upon to play a major role in the whole operation. It is only on the 18th of April uh, that the expeditionary force, as it was called, with about uh, 80,000 uh, British men and about 18,000 uh, French one, uh, reached the Dardanelles. Uh, the attack uh, was to start uh, exactly uh, a week later. Well, before the battle, on the 21st of April, Sir Ian Hamilton issued a very curious order of the day, or rather a proclamation with uh, a striking beginning. He addressed the troops as soldiers of France and of the king. Very unusual, of course. And uh, the task assigned to the French contingent was to land on the Asian coast and neutralize uh, the Turkish defenses at Kumkali. This was successfully done. But there was no way they could exploit uh, this lodgment, and they received the order to leave and make their way towards the eastern tip of the uh, Gallipoli uh, Peninsula. So they crossed again, uh, landing there on the 27th of April. Well, uh, this is a long story, of course, we do not have to go into it. The first Anglo-French offensive on the peninsula on the 28th of April resulted in deadlock, a situation which was replicated uh, in the next following days, next following weeks, next following months. The first victims in inverted commas were the French commanders. Uh, General Damad, supposedly taken ill, was asked on the 6th of May to leave for France and surrender his command to uh, General uh, Gouraud. Uh, General Gouraud, uh, the uh, Chief of the colonial troops, I will explain uh, the, uh, the right arm, the missing right arm in a minute. This is General Guru. Uh, his force was largely composed of West Indians from Martinique, of Zouave from North Africa, and a tirailleur from Senegal, with a number of men from the Foreign Legion. On the 9th of May, Admiral Gebhardt was also dismissed to be replaced by Admiral Nicol. Now, uh, I go into this because two contradictory remarks can be made uh, in this uh, connection. An unspoken uh, reproach against Damad was his poor contact with the Navy, but also with his British opposite numbers. Whereas Gebhardt was widely seen as an Anglophile, an Anglophile being a glaring exception in the French Navy. Uh, so, you see, it's contradictory. One, one was accused of being too friendly with the British and the other one of being hostile to the British. Uh, also, it seems that General Damad uh, was criticised for his lack of pugnacity, but Gebhardt, who had plenty of uh, pugnacity, uh, and joined forces with Keyes and uh, others to push Dero back to the offensive, was succeeded by a French admiral who had no uh, such uh, pugnacity. So, again, a contradiction. It is therefore extremely difficult to see any consistency in the uh, decisions taken uh, in Paris. So, assessing uh, the situation on his arrival, General Gouraud argued that uh, the only solution to the deadlock was an invasion of the Asian park of Turkey which was immediately dismissed by Joffre, who repeated that uh, he could spare no large number of troops. So you see, uh, the French have a responsibility in the uh, Dardanelles fiasco, an objective uh, responsibility. That is, uh, Joffre never yielded uh, on uh, the principle that no troops should be withdrawn from the Western Front. 
uh, in other words, uh, by insisting uh, that uh, the uh, Dardanelles should remain uh, a small force, of course, he, in a way, condemned uh, the uh, operation to, uh, at least the land operation, to failure. The fighting was fierce, uh, so fierce that General Guro lost an arm. Now, one characteristic of the Dardanelles, which is not of, often uh, insisted, insisted on, is that on the French front, the Western front, the Belgian, the Belgian front, the generals were in the rear, safe in the rear. In the Dardanelles, there was no way you could be in the rear. The rear was the ships. Uh, you, in fact, Sir Ian Hamilton commanded, apparently, from a ship. He was not uh, on land. Uh, so Guro uh, was on land and exposed uh, to fire uh, from uh, the uh, Turks. And he lost an arm uh, from, uh, from a shell. Uh, the, he was hit, not by a direct hit, of course, but by, uh, he was hoisted by an explosion, hoisted onto the, the branches of a fig tree, which uh, sounds laughable. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, he uh, had to have an arm uh, amputated. Another general uh, died of his uh, wounds uh, on the 12th of July, and still another general uh, lost uh, his, uh, his life. So you see, uh, the Dardanelles uh, uh, took a heavy toll on French uh, generals, uh, which was, again, different from the experience of the Western Front. So there was a sort of solidarity. The men uh, should have... Uh, been sensitive to that solidarity, but in practice, the morale uh, of uh, the men was extremely low. And here we have uh, a drawing from a man uh, who was an official artist uh, sent uh, to uh, the Dardanelles. He was part of uh, the staff uh, of General Gouraud. And obviously, uh, when you see that, uh, you, you think that the fighting spirit uh, of the French troops uh, uh, was absolutely nil. Uh, they are exhausted, of course, exhausted, also uh, attacked by insects, by flies, by vermin, by also suffering from the poor food, uh, and above all, the strictly uh, rationed uh, water supplies. So, again, this is a very complicated story, as you all know, uh, but from the French point of view, I would like to uh, point out that uh, the uh, political events of London in May 1915 did not go unnoticed among the French. An indirect comment came from Joffre, who remarked to the French government on the 24th of June, the general impression is spreading that on the Allied side, the war is not conducted with sufficient firmness. Joffre was suggesting that his hostility against the uh, Dardanelles uh, exhibition, uh, expedition had been uh, vindicated by events, and that amateurish uh, politicians in London and Paris uh, would have been well advised to uh, listen to his professional opinion. Again, to cut a long story short, the complex political game in France in August and September 1915 led not to, not to the abandonment of what was called the Front d'Orient, the Oriental Front as such, but to the substitution of the Salonica expedition for the Dardanelles deadlock. We will not go uh, into that, but it was clear uh, that the French uh, had uh, decided uh, that uh, the Dardanelles uh, had to be abandoned, the expedition had to be abandoned. Well, uh, we all know, of course, that on both sides, the French side, the British side, the evacuation was a success. What about the uh, casualties? Well, there is no unanimous agreement on casualty figures. But it is generally accepted uh, that a little less than 80,000 80, men were engaged at some stage or other on the French side on a sort of rota basis. Of these men who went to the Dardanelles at some stage, uh, 3,700 were killed. And here we have one of the first cemeteries. 
6,000 went missing, and just over 17,000 were wounded. Well, missing, what does that mean? Well, there were no quarters in the battles in uh, the uh, peninsula. And the missing figures, in fact, covers uh, the prisoners who were executed. And interestingly, uh, the uh, La Rousse account gives absolutely no uh, casualty uh, figures. Uh, there was sort of, of taboo uh, on, on the Dardanelles. Well, uh, for a long time, uh, this was the forgotten army, you know, the expression which is used in Britain for, for the uh, Far Eastern army in the uh, Second World War. Well, the Dardanelles was very much the second, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the forgotten army, the French forgotten army of the First World War. And it was only in 1930 uh, that a French military cemetery uh, was erected uh, on Turkish soil at Sedul Bar with the tomb of a general, one of the generals who had uh, uh, been hit uh, on the uh, uh, who had been hit on the peninsula, uh, General uh, Ganval, and uh, this monument was uh, inaugurated by uh, General Gouraud himself, the one-arm uh, general in 1930. So this dates back to 1930. Well, my conclusion, well, it was left to Joffre in his memoirs, both to accept that Churchill's conception of the operation as potentially decisive had been right. At the same time, to demolish its planning and execution. He writes, success would probably have changed the face of the war, but its defective organization and later development had led to failure. Well, I mentioned the tragedy of the Dardanelles, the title of the book by this famous journalist of the 30s. Well, his conclusion of the book seems to sum up uh, the consensus which prevails in France to this day. My translation, in the form of an apostrophe, he was addressing uh, imaginary men. Fine volunteers rushing in from Australia and New Zealand. Agile Gorkars. Smiling Senegalese. Sailors of Gebhardt and de Robeck. Soldiers from France and from all the counties of England. How heroic you all were. But what did you die for? Thank you.